fuckers, uh, welcome to another explosive episode of the Linux Let's Podcast. My name is Mike. My name is Connor. And my name is Shane. And we are the three exquisite Linux Let's. Now, before we proceed to anything else today, we have something for you, dear listeners. We have a coupon for Azire VPN for 30% off. So, Azire VPN are Swedish based. Uh, security focused VPN provider that doesn't log your traffic and uh, if you sign up for three months of their service with the code Linux Let's uh, when you're ordering you get 30% off so instead of 12 euros uh, you'll pay 840 uh, they will for the for the whole three months they uh, take bit payment in uh, cryptocurrencies cash uh, and your usual credit cards and PayPal and they don't even require that you give them your email address just um, so that you know uh, when you are applying the code don't forget to click on the green enter code or add code button otherwise it won't be applied and uh, yeah give them a try i am using them currently and uh, the service is really smooth everything works on linux and they have got a wireguard option okay so um, first bit of on the on the discussion notes today is uh, Pine64 are revealing or revealed to OMG Ubuntu at FOSDEM that they will release a tablet and a souped up Pinebook Pro. Now, for you who don't know, uh, Pine64 are making uh, Raspberry Pi like uh, single board computers and Pinebooks that I currently own uh, that are, uh, you know, underpowered a little bit, uh, ARM devices for a very reasonable price. I think the Pinebook is uh, currently at 100 euros. And uh, they said that this, later this year they will also start selling a tablet for about $79 and a uh, souped up better version of their Pinebook called Pinebook Pro for $199. Uh, guys, what do you think about this? Certainly, um, it's it's very interesting to have this whole uh, ARM single board computer. Um, ARM is notorious, um, notor- uh, not- notable worthy for its battery life, so it's very power efficient. Um, it's just a matter of getting the the CPU power up enough so that it will be viable as a laptop or desktop PC uh, CPU, or uh, they're starting to use them in in servers as well um so it's they're incredibly power efficient so to put it in a tablet or to put it in a kind of a, a mini laptop is is quite interesting and i've i've looked at your um your pine book mike and it's that certainly quite interesting it is slightly underpowered at the moment in other words you're you're having to rather than running something like gnome or kd or something you're you're running uh, i3 in order to say okay i i, I don't want it to be stuttering all around the place and being really slow so the, it's it's good that they're diversifying their and they're bringing things out in other words this this kind of more powerful pinebook pro for a slightly uh, higher price would but with more powerful um arm chip in it is certainly compelling and i mean who doesn't like a 200 dollar laptop it's it's i you can clearly see that they're targeting the kind of cheap chromebook market which in and this is pure Linux. This is not just um, the Chrome OS, which is it's technically Linux because we have the Linux kernel. But don't don't worry about that. And and Google is like saying, oh no no no, don't worry about that. We're doing something different. This is pure Linux. In other words, you as long as there's um, a Linux build for it, then you can run Arch. You can run Debian. You can run whatever you want as long as it's it's, it's a compiled for this. In other words, it's just like your regular x86 laptop. You can just pick and choose whichever image you want, and that freedom is the the antithesis of this whole community. Is if you like Arch, use Arch. If you like Debian, use Debian or whatever. It's it's your preference. Yeah, I, I'm really looking forward to the Pine tablet myself. Um, I mentioned last episode that I was very interested in getting like uh, Linux onto a tablet somehow because I just think the idea is kind of cool because, uh, you know, we've hacked computers, we've hacked laptops, we've hacked handheld devices, you know, what's left to hack? Um, and tablets really hasn't been something I've seen Linux on before. And, uh, you know, it's kind of like the Raspberry Pi effect, like because it's so cheap, it's only like $79 for a tablet. That's not much. So you're more likely to just pick up one or two of them and just uh, experiment with them. So it kind of lends itself, it lends itself to our sort of, hobby a little bit better yeah so 
uh, just to specify, so the, the pine top, as they are probably going to call it, is gonna cost uh, $79, which is just under 60 euros. It's meant to have 10.1 inch screen, two gigs of RAM and 16 gigabytes of storage and uh, some, you know, 2.0 USBs and a micro USB uh, with optional extra, with optional keyboard, with optional magnetic keyboard, sorry. Uh, so that's definitely a bit under spec and if it were an Android tablet, then it would be a horrible one. I have, um, the, I have a faith in the power of Linux into being a bit more efficient and a better host uh, to these, uh, you know, a better operating system for these less powered devices. Uh, what I'm worried for, as always, is uh, browsing because the uh, because the browsers really take a lot of resources these days. And even on the Pinebook that has got similar specs, uh, the, the browsing experience is uh, certainly the worst part of using it. I would just say that if anyone is is intrigued by this idea and would possibly pick one of these up when it comes out, but they want something um, used that's out on the market at the moment and say, no, I, I kind of want to experiment and I want to pick up something that's cheap and um, I'll be able to tinker around with it at the moment, is the Nexus 7 tablet is current is running android by default but the communities have certainly rallied around it i believe there's a new ub ports um ubuntu touch port for it there might even be a sailfish port for it as well so for people who are saying no i I want a tablet and i want to experiment on how linux runs on a tablet um i believe there is um a ubuntu touch port for the the nexus 7 so if you pick up a nexus 7 i mean it, the nexus 7 came out in 2013 or something so it's it's quite old at this stage so you probably be able to pick it up quite cheaply on the used market so if you want to t- have a tinkering device right now that's available right now i would suggest picking that up um if this whole point tab thing uh, intrigues you and then through your experimentation if you find yeah this is actually really compelling but i actually want something that runs linux natively and is supported out of the box then when it, when the point tab comes out then you'll be able to pick up pick it up for 79 year uh, dollars yeah so what uh, that was the pint of the pine book pro to me is a more compelling device because uh that laptop is going to come with 14 inch uh, 1080p display 100 uh, and uh, 6 core arm chip uh, 4 gigabytes of ram which is twice the amount in the pi- that is in the pinebooks now 64 bit um, emmc storage but it will have usb 3 and uh, 2.0 but also usb c for charging and video out so uh, that's uh, and it's probably going to be made out of some kind of a metal alloy unlike the currently plastic uh, pine books and that's a lot of uh, that's a lot of stuff to me that you can get for 199 dollars or that you will be able to get for that money i am a big fan of pine uh, 64 because uh, unlike other companies that make hardware they are to me going the same route of well they start at the cheapest possible way get people interested see where the market is going and they then produce as much as they think that they can sell and they they are not they are not making massive uh, hype waves and they are not like uh, trying to uh, trying to you know uh, rule the world and basically making making new uh, or they are not making statements about uh, big philosophies this is just a device this is how much it costs this is what it can do and uh, they they have they have always at least to be delivered what they what they promised so i really like this i i would agree certainly um i think the next big thing on the news is not to be outdone purism is revealing more information about their pure os store um apps in the store will have badges depending on um on the app development status in other words if it's a beta if it's an alpha or whatever or if, if they're saying nope this this is one, the final release this is the stable um the their plans to to um integrate Flatpak or build it around Flatpak and they've announced uh, Lollipop which is I believe it's it, it's based off Clementine or very closely related to Clementine or a fork of Clementine but anyway um the Lollipop uh, music player is going to be supported um right out of the box um and the phone itself is supposed to have things like. 
Imagine this, a replaceable battery and a headphone jack. Ooh. Yeah, I'm not sure about Lollipop being based of Clementine. You might be right, but I think everything in the uh, in the Librem 5 direction, uh, like kind of ecosystem is based on GTK, where, or in the purism ecosystem is based on GTK, but I think Clementine is a uh, cute uh, oh, application. Oh, uh, yeah, could be, could be mistaken. But I could be mistaken too. Now, what... What kind of annoys me about this is two things, right? Well, actually, no. It's just one thing. So you have got on one side uh, the Pine64 people who are selling you stuff that say that that you might choose to use for production or production to choose to, like, you know, use for your digital life. You might have to make sacrifices, but it's under $200. Librem are going to sell you stuff... That is what seven hundred dollars if you unless you buy it early, and for seven hundred dollars I would expect certain level of hardware. The Librem phone, according to them, is gonna have fourteen forty by seven twenty display. Now I'm not a big display guy. You can you know to, as far as I'm concerned, you can stick your retina up your arse. <laughs> but that uh, yeah, I just realized what it sounded like. Anyway, uh, it it it. Uh, Seven between the difference between 720 display and 1080p display is apparent even to me. So, so I had two phones in my hand. One had 720 by I don't know what, and the other one had 1080 by 1920. And I can and the difference in usage was unbelievable. So the fact that they are trying to sell a 720 display for 700 dollars is astonishing to me. Uh, just. You know, that's, that, I, it's one of those weird things that I pick up on and I just won't won't be... Prob- and it will probably make me not buy the Librem phone because I feel like uh, in this day and age, you shouldn't really be trying to do that. What do you guys think about that? Um, to, uh, a quick point of clarification. I looked it up while uh, Mike was talking. I was thinking about the Strawberry music player, which is a fork of Clementine. So I will correct myself um, and say that Lollipop is not related to Clementine. As far as I'm aware, I was thinking of the Strawberry f- uh, music player, which is a fork of Clementine. But, yeah, <laughs> I'm, carry I'm very on. hungry <laughs> all of a sudden. <laughs> yeah, you've got the stro- Strawberry Lollipop Clementine conundrum. Yeah, that sounds delicious. But... um. Yeah, uh, just going back to what Mike was saying about the screen resolution, um, I can't but agree with that because that's not a, that's not a usable mobile resolution in this day and age. Like, okay, usable depends on your 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 meaning of the word, but like, um, that's just not practical because, like, I look at my phone, the OnePlus Six T. It's got like basically a cinema screen turned ninety degrees in terms of resolution. So um, that's tended to be is I think. Yeah, but it's like it's the same resolution as some TVs, like uh, in terms of pixel density. Um, but uh, yeah, it's crazy. Like uh, that's I don't know. I don't maybe as a first generation, you know, wet the appetite of the community kind of device could work. But I don't. I think they would have an uphill battle um, with specs like that. I mean, they're they're. It's more the principle and the ideal of the device that's going to sell it, I think. I don't think it's going to be a fantastic device, specs-wise. Well, they are going to, obviously, they are making all the applications and they are uh, creating an ecosystem for developers. So they are going to uh, adjust the applications to the phone. So it might come up looking all right, but then you've got all the things. So that's for the applications that they will do. Now, there is a hell of a lot of stuff outside of that scope that they promise to make up for by doing like web apps so you have your twitter that they might not have a native app for i'm just ma- making this up but i saw the twitter icon on there in that segment of their website so you might have say twitter there might not be a native app for uh, the librem phone but they will conjure some kind of a web app now that's going to be made out of the twitter website and that might not be very well suited for a 720 by 1440 resolution on a 9 9 to 18 ratio phone or 18 by 9 ratio phone so you know if they were making everything in-house and there was no outside uh no outside stuff then maybe but since they are gonna have to or the users are going to have to cope with the world with the you know with the <laughs> with the web, with the websites and everything, and in a day and age where even my cheap Motorola ha- is 1080 by 1920, I think it's definitely 1080 at the low, lower bottom, at the lower resolution. And when we had, we have had 1080p phones since 2015 or maybe even before that. Yeah, I, I don't know. It's just some 
a random thing that uh, co- that I think is gonna be is gonna make that phone very much less valuable. <sighs> I I'd be inclined to agree. I mean, um, with broadly with what you, both of you guys are saying, that a seven twenty p display in this day and age is a bit of of when you're looking at things going, oh, that spec looks good, that spec looks good, and then you come to this, and you're going, ah, oh, really, seven twenty p? It's kind of a bit of a a punch in the gut. Um, but everything around the 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 Libram phone is exciting. The whole thing of that it's open uh, as much, as, and you can, um, if you'd like your KD Plasma Mobile, put that on. Oh, even though um, GNOME I think is is officially supported by default um, from um, Purism themselves. But I I believe the um, the KD Plasma um, Mobile will be. Um, unofficially supported and others effectively you could say yeah just follow this link and you'll be able to do it um, but it's not you won't be able to go to um, Purism if you have any issues I think you'd have to go to KD themselves but uh, yeah anyway um, but the, that whole idea of being open is really really compelling it's just come on guys can you not just put a 10, 1080p screen um, there's po- a possibility that they're trying to pull a Firefox OS. Um, the, the kind of uh, short-lived plans Firefox or Mozilla had to release like uh, a phone and a whole mobile ecosystem. Um, I, I read know, the web browser. Yeah, it did remind me of that. They they t- they kind of uh, targeted the de- the developing market, you know, because obviously it's a foundation, so it's their goal. But um, yeah, Purism could find a niche there. Um, it's possible. Um, and especially the fact that it's not tied to an ecosystem, it could get around uh, get around regional quirks, you know, like uh, censorship of, of government and, and, you know, poor communication, poor infrastructure, things like that. Like they could find more ingenious solutions to get around that using a more open device. Well, uh, I actually had a Firefox OS phone back in the day. Uh, and please don't tell me that, that, that that's what it is that they are trying to pull off for $700. That, that would be just desperate because the thing never worked properly and there is a, such a thing as too much of a browser in better news though according to Foronix, they are trying to pull off uh or they might be uh planning on subscription of ethical device ethical service bundle so imagine your like icloud or me.com or your um, uh Google kind of ecosystem, but ethical and privacy conscious and security focused by these folks, I think that would be a clear win because good services is what you really need these days whatever where you put everything into cloud and if they if they did one thing, then that would be you know if 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 the phone is too expensive for me to buy and too crappy for me to spend that much money. If uh, I never get the hands on their uh, on their laptops, that uh, I would still uh, be really happy if if they have a reasonably priced uh, ethical services bundle. Oh, oh, certainly. Um, um, now that you're explaining it, it would certainly be that would be something that would be very um excited to find out about. I mean, if is the whole thing of let's say you're paying five or a month or ten or a month or whatever, and it's like, okay. We have a a calendar. We have mail. We have whatever, or we uh, there, and we're throwing in a bit of cloud storage with it as well. And if that's coming from Purism, yeah, hell yeah, that would be compelling. I, I like, I like if if they release that as as what I'm conceptualizing. I'm not saying that is what they're planning to do, but if that concept is what the, it is. Sign me up right now. Yeah, just to clarify, I think at this point it's nothing more than just a mention in the blog of the CEOs of the of the Purism CEO or something that that Foronix uh, caught up on and reported. But yeah, hopefully they will they will manage to get uh, get that done. Okay, in uh, in other news, um, Steam Play now allows to add non Steam Windows games, uh, so games that. Uh, uh, get you bought somewhere else, uh, and they are for Windows. You can now use the Proton ecosystem to to launch them and play them on Linux as well. I think that's another huge step for uh, for uh, Linux as a platform to be able to do what the others already, or well, not the others, Mac can't do that, but what uh, what Windows already so easily do. Yeah, I, I was I was looking into this um, as we're leading up to this episode. Um, it the the way um the article kind of 
um, sells it is that you might be able to run another um, front end that only exists on Windows to run your your apps for free. So, for example, I think what is the um, um, Blizzard and Activision and things like that. They kind of have their their own launcher in in order to to launch the game, and they're like, maybe you could, you could uh, go into Steam, add that .dot exe launcher, and say, I want you to go and Steam play on Linux, launch that .dot exe, and then I'll be able to to go into the game that I legitimately own. In other words, we're not advocating that you're doing any kind of illegal trying to get around things that here is you legitimately own this stuff and you want to play it on Linux this is um a, would be a way of just saying okay dot this dot exe since they don't support it on my platform just launch it within Steam so I can play my game um and of course hackers being hackers well not necessarily uh, hackers but hackers just in the sense of the community as a whole are thinking hmm what about this uh, really old game, like from, uh, I don't know, Windows 95 era or something like that. I just have a .exe just lying around on, on my computer. Um, and then they launched that through Steam Play on, on, on Linux. And just there's videos of people going, holy shit, this actually works. So <laughs> it's that whole thing of people just experimenting and getting excited around it, which is really, really, really compelling. Um, and there's actually reports that um, the uh, the the Windows version of a game running through this um, Steam Play is actually running better than if let's say if a game has a native port for for the game. Um, and then there's the Windows version. The Windows version running through Steam Play actually is is running better with better frames per second than the native port that was for linux so that is also very compelling so that just shows how good is the con uh, how good is the uh interpretation layer that is wine and how good is the implementation by steam and how shit some of the ports are uh, <laughs> yeah. more more details obviously are in the jason evangelos article that we've sourced this from and the links is going to be in the show notes uh notwithstanding uh any like even 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 after some uh, time of the Proton Steam Play going on, uh, the Linux uh, Linux uh, Steam usage, according to new release newly released stats, apparently is still sitting flat at zero point eighty two percent. Did we expect it to go higher? Like, did we expect it to be at say about five or something when Proton started Hon- out? Honestly, yes. Um, I really thought it would be a lot higher than that. Like that's quite surprising that it's so low. Um, yeah, that's uh, yeah, that's definitely a shocker. Um, I w- never would have uh, considered it less than one percent. I mean, if you'd asked me to guess, I would have said somewhere around the region of five to ten. But um, yeah, obviously not realistic. It's a lot of uh, Linux users uh, who are sticking re- religiously to Linux for everything else still mm. do a boot for gaming because if frames per second and latency and that kind of things is your is your thing, that I think uh, Windows still might be more performant. And I don't have anything to back this up because I'm not a gamer. But I think that the, it, if you if you really are to eke out the last bit of performance from your hardware, then you probably still go to uh, go to uh, Windows. Um, I don't say I'm not saying this is the this is the fact for everybody. There are, is definitely a ton of Linux gamers, but it might be just uh, one of the reasons why the number is so low. Another one is that Steam is constantly continuously expanding. So what is 82.82 percent of usage in December might be 8.82 percent out of a massively higher number in January, which uh, which would mean uh, you know that maybe our adoption is also raising, but because it's a percentage then. Uh, we the number stays the same. I guess the, yeah, there's so much money point, yeah. in the video games industry that even one percent of that, if that can be tapped, that's still a lot of money. So it's probably still worthwhile for some companies. Yeah, I kind of suspect that Steam is trying to basically create a cross-platform application delivery, a cross, uh, pl- yeah, cross-platform application delivery uh, service, where eventually, maybe in five to ten years. Uh, they are just going to be, you know, you just wanted to have uh, an application on Android, you steam it, a application, a, a program on, on Linux, you steam it, a game on Xbox, well, probably not, but uh, uh, 
you know, I I'm, I think that their their goals are uh, very ambitious, and obviously, I don't have any any insight into the company. I believe, but uh, sorry, I believe what they're trying to do is. Uh, I heard a quote from. Um, uh, I'd have to look this up, but I, I believe it was the CEO. Um, he was saying that uh, the the goal is to get away from Windows and Mac OS, so they don't want to have to depend on other OSs. So they they're kind of backing Linux because that allows them to create their kind of own operating system essentially and uh, so they can base all their software they kind of have it all on their own terms essentially and they won't get locked into uh, other ecosystems or become dependent on them well there's the ultimate Linux pragmatism isn't it so I, I uh, this is this is where the freedom becomes real when you are just not locking yourself in and depending on someone else's decision on the on the point of um People, you were saying that it's maybe not just games that they'd be able to launch, pa- um, um, just general applications f- through Steam. I mean, you can do that al- already. I mean, there's a Steam so- store and there's like um, photography manipulation apps that you can buy through the Steam store. There's things like that. I mean, it's it's are now nowhere near as prevalent as their games. It's primarily a gaming platform. But if you look, there are. Um, just I I think there's even um, video editing and audio editing and photo editing software they can just buy through Steam and that that is the, supposed to be cross platform as well so it's a, it's a, they're they're using it as a front end as a vector of saying put your application here and we're guaranteeing that it's going to be cross platform. Yeah, uh, another good gaming news is that the Lutris open gaming platform has a new release uh it's the release 0.5 with uh, good old games service integration so you will now be able to use lutris to manage your good old games uh, uh good old games games and uh it also has got a, a revamped interface it's all done in gtk3 so it's gonna look pretty i'm sure uh, do you guys lose lutris i i don't um, I've I've heard of it uh, quite a few times, so it's kind of been on my radar, but I've never really checked it out. Um, the the GOG service integration is uh, quite exciting for me because I do have um about maybe ten or fifteen games on GOG, possibly more. I've uh haven't checked it in a while, but um, I've I've a good good chunk of games on on GOG, and their GOG kind of teased the us Linux users by saying, well, we've GOG Galaxy and we're launching it on Windows and we're launching it on Mac and this it was always like a, a coming soon for Linux. I mean, that coming soon has been there for freaking over a year, um, possibly longer. So they've they've kind of been um, dick teasing it there, or just there for a bit. Uh, and so this whole thing of Luther's just saying, yeah, this, this thing is never coming. Screw it. We're just going to, um, allow you to launch your GOG games, uh, through us. And that just, uh, makes it really compelling. Uh, so just to enlighten me, I don't, uh, I'm not a big gamer. So the GOG Galaxy, is it like a place? Is it like an app store for, for their games or? Um, it's their, is their answer to Steam effectively. So they're saying that, um, you're going to have a program. Um, you open it up and there's all your games listed and if you they would have uh, like um, matchmaking maybe chat with your friends through the app um, if I, yeah, if you understand Steam you'll get understand this there might be kind of achievements um, in this part of collection it. items and stuff like yeah, that yeah, that, okay. that, that whole thing again I've not really used it because I've never been able to launch a GOG Galaxy on Linux I have tried to launch it through Wine a couple of times and it, uh, Wine just throws up a freaking DLL error or something um, so it, it it's, they've never really made it um, Linux friendly unfortunately in in other release news Code 18 um has been released. Kodi obviously is the media player platform that you can run as an application or stand on. A lot of people try using it on or, or choose to use it on a Raspberry Pi connected to their telly. Kodi uh, has a bad name in mainstream press for piracy and stuff, but it can be actually used uh, absolutely legitimately. Uh, f- uh, fucking unfortunate. <laughs> yeah, it is. It is. Uh, it is horrible. But then again, that's the mainstream media to you. Um, it's. Uh, it's uh, basically you can use it as you would use uh, another any other uh, media server. You can basically turn your Raspberry Pi or your old computer into a set top box and a media server, connected to your tele, and it will work quite well. I personally 
always get a bit confused when using it because I uh, I like computer menus and I don't I'm not necessarily a big TV guy. I tried uh, downloading Kodi 18 or to a Raspberry Pi running Arch, obviously, and uh, it installed and everything, and I connected it to the telly, but then it didn't. Um, it didn't uh, respond to my uh, television uh, uh, remote control, which obviously is a big flaw. I can connect a mouse to the Raspberry Pi, but I kind of defeat the objective. I'm sure there might be like an app or something that you could use uh, my uh, Android phone, but I did all that uh, yesterday, so I didn't have time to test it more. But uh, yeah, the interface looks good. That's all I can say so far. I'm actually surprised um, that you lasted this long into the podcast without well, without mentioning Arch. Um, <laughs> Libra Alec, I think, is, if you go and search for Libra Alec, is their whole thing is they are just Kodi and it's just enough operating system to run Kodi and it's specifically for the Raspberry Pi so if you download that image put it onto your SD card and boot it up for the Raspberry Pi it's effectively turning your Raspberry Pi into just a Kodi delivery device that is that is awesome and I tried it but the problem is that uh, as of yesterday you still downloaded uh, Kodi 17.6 rather than 18. There might be ways to update it but the official image has got the old version of Kodi. I'm not sure how f- how fast they are in doing that. Uh, they're, yeah. they're, that's their whole thing. They're usually pretty um, pretty good. Um, it's so my... If there if there's any kind of delay, they're just fi- uh, probably just figuring out some last uh, li- 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 last little things. They're usually only a day or two behind the official version of Cody once it comes out, and that was their whole fork of there was open a lek and Libra Lek was their whole thing of no no we're we're straying we're trying to stay as close as possible to upstream, uh, whereas Open and Lek was kind of yeah we're we're taking the release but we're kind of doing a snapshot and we're kind of taking our time and we're kind of doing our and meantime not, no no guys there's an exciting new version coming out so yeah yeah we'll get we'll get around to that in a month or two or something so that was Open and Lek and Libra Lek were like no no we're staying close to upstream so um if there if there wasn't updated now i would imagine like certainly within a couple of days a week or two at most they'll be up to the latest version i always found uh open alec uh you mentioned it there i was actually going to jump in and ask the question like uh, is open alec and libra alec similar or is libra just more libra you know more freedom in the dimensions and all that um <laughs> that's my understanding of the difference between more the two positive in the freedom dimension because it's libra which is uh, higher than open in the hierarchy, evidently, and um, <laughs> and then uh, yeah. So I I, I have used uh, open elec, but I found it uh, a lot nicer to use than stock Cody. Actually, it was much more. I don't know. It just had a nicer feel to it. Like it was more user friendly. I found, and it held your hand a little bit more because uh, I found uh, Cody could be a little bit uh, overwhelming at first, and there was a lot of menu diving. Um, but uh, Open Elec on the Raspberry Pi ran very nicely. Um, I really would love to get my Raspberry Pi media box up and running again because I genuinely found that useful before. Um, yeah, you could just you have a network share. You could just throw the files onto it. Um, you know, it was nice and quick. The Raspberry Pi was connected to your router via Ethernet, so it was just there was no bottleneck there. It was. It just worked very well. Yeah, as I said, I I stuttered on the fir- or stumbled on the first hurdle when I wasn't able to get my uh, remote control working. I don't know if that was maybe a missing driver in the Arch installation, and maybe it will be fixed when I try Libra. Like, uh, yeah, hopefully because uh, TV without a remote. What is this? Nineteen eighty six. Probably another way to conceptualize it is for people who are completely unfamiliar with Open and Lek or Libra Lek. Um, quite possibly imagine Libra Lek is Linux Mint Debian in addition to Debian. In other words, they take what whatever Debian is doing and then they do some very slight customizations on top of it, but it's effectively um, trying to stay as close to Debian as possible. Whereas Open and Lek is kind of Ubuntu to Debian. In other words, they're saying, yeah, we're taking what Debian is doing, but we're kind of doing our own thing with it. And that, that, I, 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 that's my understanding of the of the whole thing. So, um. So uh, Libra Lek will be much faster to update to the 
the latest Kodi version because they're trying to stay as close as possible to the Kodi development whereas Open Elec kind of take a snapshot of it and go yeah okay well we'll eventually get around to the new version when on on our terms rather than trying to do it as soon as as soon as possible yeah in in so in the latest Kodi 18 release uh, apart from uh, a Apart from like general model, the improvements and the changes that stand out are that there is a retro player gaming built in, so you can now turn your uh, Kodi Raspberry Pi into a uh, in, into like a retro gaming console easily. Uh, digital rights management uh, decryption support, which is going to be controversial. I don't know if this leads to you being able to play uh, Netflix through Kodi, I would say it might. Uh, This is obviously a massive debate, like, should we even try this? Uh, I am... uh, Basically what it means that you are supporting someone else's uh, attempt at proprietary uh, intellectual rights or intellectual property rights. I think... I'm, I'm, I'm pragmatic about this. I don't really care what happens to the to the contents once I watched it, I don't have the need to own, to own like movies or own TV series, otherwise I bought a DVD. So I don't really care that it's DRM laden because uh, if it o- ever goes away, yeah, whatever, I'll be like, meh. Uh, if there was something that I would really want to keep uh, for whatever reason, then I obviously would uh, not like get a DRM laden copy of it. I would get something like a DVD and decrypt it, or uh, maybe pay for uh, pay for a DRM version and then download it on Pirate Bay or something like that. Because obviously, uh, this is uh, you know if you are if you are in fa- or if you are uh, getting something with DRM, you are risking that one one day it will go away. What do you guys think about? Um, for me, it's um, it's the demand is where the uh, is the delivery system. So in other words, um, people chose DVDs because that's that was their preferred um way of viewing the the information at the time was to just get it rent a disc or buy a disc and stick it into their player, and then that's what and it's. Um, the industry is moving towards the streaming, whether it's whether it's um Netflix um streaming or um music as well with Spotify or whatever the other programs um so and I don't list I mean it's it's their creative um their thing whether it's a TV show or a movie or something it's like I I don't mind the fact that it's the same thing with a song I'm I'm I've no problem paying for a song because it's like and and the the artist has the rights to that song it's like yep. Yeah, that's cool because I'm 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 I've paid to listen to the song. Um, I'm perfectly okay with that exchange. If the if the artist want to say I'm releasing this under a Creative Commons license license and I permit you to sample it and uh, rehash it and um, do that whole thing, I'm I'm okay with that because it's the artist's decision. Um, but if the artist want to say no, nope, this is my creative works and um, uh, you have to ask me permission uh, ask my permission if you want to sample it or you may owe me royal royalty rights if you um if you want to resample it or if you want to replay it or something like that it's i i don't necessarily object to that because i'm like yeah i'm i'm just paying to consume your 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 work um same thing with uh, uh, uh tv shows or or movies i've no problem going to a cinema and and, and paying for the the experience as well as pay, contributing towards the production of that movie. Um, I'm I'm not a person of saying everything has to be free, everything has to be open, everything has to be um Creative Commons or whatever. Um, in software, it it does make sense. Um, more sense to me, but in in terms of the creative medium, um, not necessarily. I can take it or leave it. Uh, to me, this is a question. So. There are two questions, right? I'm a consumer of the media, so to me, because it's basically a single use, like most TV shows and movies are single, and, well, songs not, but basically it's all single use, and if it goes away, I don't give a fuck. Then, uh, yeah, you can put whatever restrictions you want on it. From the point of view of the artist, I think uh, it's short-sighted. It might be pragmatic 
in the moment because they need all the recording companies need to turn a quick buck but they are hurting the community obviously and they are hurting creativity by not releasing it uh, uh, as creative commons because if you have to respect some ridiculous uh, loyalty law or intellectual property law just so that you can sample uh, sample someone else's creation in your own creation well that's that's an obstacle to creativity but uh, that's just not much to do with me since I'm not creating content but uh, yeah I think it it uh, like for the artists it really depends on whether they want to like make money now or if they uh, whether, or if they want to help uh, the ecosystem for the, for want of a douche word yeah just uh, you mentioned something there you said uh, I'm not creating content but you actually are creating content oh, right I was now. just going to say that <laughs> oh yeah fuck you're right I mean uh... we do actually license this podcast uh, under creative commons don't we yeah we do, yeah, uh, and uh, I'm I'm happy with that. I think we are. I mean, I don't think there are much chances of, of everybody sampling this into a into a music video or whatever. But uh, if anybody wanted to, they are welcome to. Yeah, I was just going to say, cue somebody um, taking you saying the word "fuck" and using it as their 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 SMS tone or something. <laughs> uh, yeah, sure. I mean, I can I can go on like you know balls, shit, dick. Do I need to carry on? People will make a mic, mic cursing soundboard. Yeah, that would be so cool. Uh, as long as you can make it, as long as it's open source, obviously. Um, anyway, if that's all we have uh, to say about Cody and uh, the DRM, uh, I'll report back when, when and if I get the remote control working and then uh, I'll try some usage of of code 18 in other news uh, my favorite most favorite uh, desktop environment ever for the next foreseeable future probably like six months gnome is going to release some sp- uh, is going to release the 3.32 release with speed enhancements and that's a good news i think because uh, that's uh, uh, speed enhancements are always good. Uh, Gnome is known to be on bit on the bulkier side and a bit sluggish. Uh, also, it's the desktop environment of choice for Ubuntu, which happens to be the most. Uh, so I assume that this is the most installed desktop ever. So uh, thanks to the work of the Gnome developers and uh, also people from Canonical and I assume Red Hat and other companies, uh, we are gonna have faster Gnome. This is this is definitely um very good very good thing um the whole thing I, I've I've had my um moments with GNOME in the past let's just say um but the, anything is any improvements is is always welcome especially since it's so widely um installed so widely distributed as as you're saying it's kind of default on on um Red Hat um Enterprise Fedora um. Uh, OpenSUSE have it as one of their options as well, uh, and it's default on Ubuntu. Um, I'll probably be corrected and uh, 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 on this, but I, I, for me, this seems to be Canonical's influence. In other words, Canonical have adopted GNOME. They're slowly and surely have been contributing code, but the the, the whole thing of um, let's just make this f- faster, make this better u- uh, desktop user um, experience. Um, I can kind of see Canonical's influence in this. Yeah, I think this is a source again from an OMG Ubuntu article, and I think he mentions that uh, he's he he mentions the Ubuntu developers uh, in well, exactly what you said. So the link is going to be in the show notes. There is another release. Um, Firefox 65 is out now. Uh, I'm already running it on my Arch install, obviously. Of course. And, uh, uh, yeah, it's uh, protecting me better against Stack Machine, which is some kind of a security attack that uh, I'm too lazy to even start thinking about. Um, but it's good. It's more security. It's basically uh, like thicker condoms with all the pleasure. <laughs> uh uh, and uh, other than that, support for the WebP, uh, which is a uh, Google's uh, image uh, image format. Again, nothing I came across as far as I can it, tell. It's their kind of media wrapper. You can you can do um, Im, um, videos. I think it is. So it's, it's I think it's their rival to. Um, uh, it, it's like wrapped up in HTML five, and it's it's uh, uh, you know it's their rival to the um, the X two six five. Um, format, which is the 
the spiritual successor of the X two sixty four codec. I think WebP is is Google's rival to that. Yeah, you know, to me, you mentioned web technologies, and my brain just goes crying in the corner eating chocolate. Uh, the Revamp Task Manager might be worth it. I haven't checked it out yet, and uh, but. There will be new release Firefox 66 that uh, apparently will come with uh, client side decorations in, uh, enabled by default. Controversy. Um, I'm running Firefox 66 at the moment because I'm on beta, y'all. Um, I I haven't really noticed that. Um, uh, obviously, uh, because of uh, aforementioned, uh, my audio interface only seems to work on Windows. So I'm currently reusing Windows to record this, but I do have my laptop that is that is uh, running Linux. So uh, and he's running Firefox sixty six. So I haven't really noticed the um, the client side decorations being, in, being enabled by default. But then again, um, it could be that because it upgraded from a previous version. Or also, there is there is this, an option in the settings to deselect the title bar, um, so I'm at which I've done already, so I probably wouldn't have noticed anyway. Um, so the client side decorations are exactly that. In the customized tab, you click on deselect in in deselect title bar, and that's you using the client side okay, decorations. Yeah, yeah. yeah so it's, it's just uh, that by default. This is gonna be by default in Firefox sixty six, and I can just see people getting very upset about that uh for why it, I mean, it looks way better as for somebody yes of course it does at least to me and many other people but i'm sure can, can someone explain client side decorations is that where you can like draw on the web page is that what that is uh, oh no no uh it's you know when you have got the chrome like the uh, basically the title bar with where all your buttons are uh, oh, yeah. So on your window, so you have a window of an application and it has got these uh, maximize, minimize, close buttons. Yeah. Imagine you put a little search uh, button in there as well. Oh, okay. Right? Or, or you put, uh, it's, it's basically like GNOME is famous for doing that. You, instead of strict delineation in the window between the title bar and the menu bar and the other areas, you just kind of uh, smash smash it together at least that's my understanding that's what it turns up looking out looking like technically it might be something else yeah so to in order to visualize this um for anyone who's ever used gnome in the past so if you um if you run gnome and for example um uh, Nautilus or GNOME files. I'm just using that as a, as, a, as an example because it's a native gnome app and the whole thing of you have your your buttons for navigating the the um, file browser. You have your search and everything like that. But beside the search um, bar is your um, close button, rather than it being above and in its own separate area. It's kind of all integrated on one line. That's essentially what the um, client side decorations are. Um, massive oversimplification. I guarantee there's going to be no developers screaming at us in, in the emails uh, saying, well, actually, it's something quite different. Uh, it's not quite what how you're explaining. This is a massive oversimplification. But to give people a rough idea um, of what client side decorations are. Yeah, it, uh, it sometimes leads uh, to, for example, GNOME applications uh, having two bars on KDE or something like that. These things are still being ironed out as far as I understand it. But Firefox is uh, basically following the lead, following the curve and uh, it's going to have it enabled by default. And whoever doesn't like it, they can just turn, the, turn it off easily. So, uh, you know... Uh, yeah, just the way it's a, it's a toggle now to turn it on. I'm presuming, again, I, I don't know, but I'm presuming it, uh, you could just go in and you could just toggle it off in the in the settings, just like you can toggle it on now. Yeah, it's exactly exactly that. Uh, in other, uh, <laughs> there's another entry in the, in the uh, notes. Basically, I was listening to uh, Linux Unplugged, the not the latest one, but I'm talking about the one before. And there was something that I wanted to bring up here as well. There was an interview with a designer, with a developer who's designing a tool called Akira, which is uh, just for developers uh, to, or for designers to design uh, GUI applications without the actual programming logic and everything. Just a good thing, just like a good design tool that uh, that uh, shows 
that enables them to uh, to you know design windows, uh, dial dialogues, buttons, that kind of thing, uh, and it uh, it works with the way designers are meant to work. Now that's nothing to me because I don't do this kind of job, but it ties in with the with the moan I had uh, in the last uh, in the last episode that when I said that there are certain tools uh, missing from the ecosystem in Linux that would that exist on the Mac and exist on Windows and that uh, that would make things easier. So I'm happy that I uh, that there seems to be uh, things still happening that bring us these uh, really useful, if niche, applications. And uh, this application is getting kickstarted, so I'm just going to pop the Kickstarter uh, link into the show notes uh, because as well as doing a really cool thing, they went about the Kickstarter in an interesting way. They said, we'll need this amount of uh, Canadian dollars and uh, this is to pay uh, development for this amount of time uh, and also taxes and uh, and also because in Canada, obviously, they have to pay quite high taxes, they say, and uh, also testing hardware. So uh, they, they, went, they honestly just broke down how much money they need and what they need it for and what time period they are going to be use, uh, be developing. And I think that is a really great and uh, great approach to uh, basically it's a good good thing happening. And uh, so I wanted to talk about that. Uh, one thing I'll just say is absolutely epic title. Uh, anyone who's an anime fan, um, Akira is a, a really, really fantastic movie. Um I and this whole I agree with you. This whole thing of people creating really good, compelling applications, and I think they're doing it for Linux first. As in, I think in the interview he says there may be um um like it's kind of an afterthought. There may be a Windows or maybe a Mac port uh, further down the line, and they're or they're also saying um because it's open source, if anyone wants to um donate their time and port it to these platforms. Uh, feel free they're not going to put any barriers in place because it's open source but they're doing linux first um saying no um we're noticing that these type of applications are kind of lacking in the linux ecosystem so we're going to create one and um their whole thing of their them buying hardware in other words they're going to buy the expensive wacom tablets and things that people use to because otherwise they'll they'll get the designer saying oh i, I have this like five thousand dollar Wacom tablet, and it's it's not working with your application, so therefore I'm not going to use it. And um, so they're buying all the hardware in order to test all these use cases, which is really really good because it means that they understand their audience, um, and they're not just uh, half heartedly doing it. And just, uh, another point is, as you say, they they broke down their costs. They're saying X amount is going over to taxes. X amount is going over to to pay these developers for x amount of time the the if you go on their kickstarter page the breakdown of their of their costs and their justification for the the amount that they're asking for is it's it's all there i mean it's not like they're they're saying yeah we're, we're going to use the this chunk of change for development and the rest of it is for us to buy freaking ice creams or whatever um it's them saying nope it, this amount of money is for me to pay rent. This amount of money is for me for food. <laughs> this amount of money is is for me to pay the Canadian government taxes. It it's really it's really uh, refreshing that they're that honest about their breakdown of their funds. Yeah, uh, and uh, the yeah. So the link to the show, to the Kickstarter and the link to the Linux Unplugged interview are gonna be in the show notes as well. Uh, another entry: update your boxen. And that's boxing with an N uh, for anybody who gets that reference old enough. Uh, Ubuntu uh, Ubuntu security notices is a website that mentions uh, that mentions security vulnerabilities. I don't understand half of them, but just the look of how many there are in such a limited scope of time uh, basically makes me to update everything I get can get my hands on and uh, there's been a few vulnerabilities in uh, in apt uh, and in the linux kernel recently so people uh, just bloody do it indeed mm -hmm. and next piece of news hp is joining in with the lvfs firmware upgrade process so um 
I believe Lenovo and a couple of other uh, Dell and Dell. Dell and Lenovo have all, are the previous ones, and I believe the um the was it was it the I can't remember who's who did it, but they might have been Lenovo or might have been somebody uh, just writing an article about the news about when Lenovo did it, and they pretty much called out HP saying uh, HP get your shit together. So apparently HP were, <laughs> were listening or or were 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 probably in the process of doing it anyway. It just took them a bit longer, but now um, it seems to be that HP um, have now officially joined in in the firmware upgrade goodness. Yeah, I think it's uh, it's the guy who the main developer on the on the LVFS project well, yeah. uh, was. It was in some interview. He was basically calling them out. Uh, I think so far it's on a handful of machines. Uh, there will be obviously a link in the link in the show notes. But it's great that uh, you can do that. This is also getting very much better in uh, uh, in in uh, to do in Lin- on Linux to update firmware, which is which historically hasn't been very easy. You would have to boot into Windows and uh, do it that way. But um, yeah, we are we are progressing and we are progressing in a very good direction. Um, so that's that's all the news we have for today. Yeah, so uh, OpenStreetMap Ireland will have an event on in Belfast on the 16th of February. There is going to be a link in the show notes. We've had uh, Ted from OSMI uh, in uh, uh, for an for a for an episode in uh, last year, and uh, if anybody is interested and in that area, that's definitely going to be uh, going to be a good one. So get your get your maps out, people, or mapping applications, more to the point. Uh, for Stalk Life, uh, with uh, yours through lease, is going to happen <laughs> on the, uh, on the, what is it, the 8th of, yeah, that's, that shows how well prepared I am, on the 8th <laughs> of June, I think. Obviously, the proper date is going to be in the show notes. Yeah, it's the 8th of June. Um, and we, we, we've been invited along, so we, we'll, we'll certainly be there in some capacity, whether we're doing... Uh, a recording or some sort. Anyway, we're going to be there in some capacity anyway. It's it's a pop, so we might be there in some incapacity. Hey. Uh, <laughs> and uh, so uh, on the on the title at the moment is uh, apart from us the Ubuntu podcast, uh, late night Linux people, uh, and I think Stuart Langridge and uh, Dave Mega Slippers as well as Marius Quabek. Uh, more details are going to be in the show notes. Uh, and of course, Ockcamp 2019 is confirmed to be happening in October, I think, in Manchester. Uh, the formerly European city of Manchester. <laughs> <laughs> Come Burn. on, I cannot I cannot not get in a Brexit reference? Uh, so uh, yeah, that's gonna that's always a good fun as well. Um, um, our camp is, is all very interesting. If you want to listen back to our second episode, I believe is us basically heaping praises on our experience on our camp uh, we highly enjoyed it the last time we were there so yeah. we hope hopefully we'll try to make it he- uh, the, this year as well um, obviously work and uh, financial yeah you have to get that and pay for the accommodation yeah pay for the accommodation and, uh, yeah. and that, so on and so forth um, so yeah hopefully we will be able to make both those uh, events Fosok and our camp and we hope to see people there so if you see us feel free to come up to us and say hey aren't you the Linux guys la- or Linux lads guys yeah but don't punch us in the nose before warn- without warning uh, so we can duck so we can duck exactly uh, yeah basically I wanted to say that our camp is like uh, nerdy orgasm but it lasts three days <laughs> uh, <laughs> it, it's, it's, it's like Viagra for your Linux boner yeah, wow, wow. And uh, nice, segue. nice segue into the bonus section. Well, this bonus section is more more like a correction than everything. Last episode, I said that it's absolutely vital, necessary, and everything to have the uh, top icons plus extension on the, on your GNOME desktop because, uh, because it just makes things like uh, Telegram usable and stuff. Well, since that, I tried to live in without it, partially because on my Arch desktop, uh, the GNOME is by default using Wayland, and these extensions don't actually work very well anyway. No, extensions, sorry. These icons don't work very well anyway on Wayland desktop. You click on them and nothing happens, so I thought, well, to hell with it. Might just as well try uh, not having them, and uh, I didn't even notice the difference, so I was wrong. 
maybe the GNOME develop team actually know what they are doing, uh, unlike me. This week I have no boners, unfortunately. Um, it's a bit of a dysfunction there, Shane. Yeah. <laughs> uh, my <laughs> boner th- this week also went... Wah, wah. Yeah, it's a, it's a very... Well, it must be the cold. It's a flaccid oh. week, you know. Oh. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah, but... My, I mean, my non-Linux boner, I guess, is uh, Copenhagen because I was there last week and it was lovely. And I sorry, ter- all, all the people there—that's a bit of a. <laughs> are they all looking that great? Yeah. Well, yes. Uh, having, having seen Scandinavians, I can confirm they all do look that, that great. Yeah, it's just a very nice place. Um, but uh, yeah, so yeah, Copenhagen is my boner because I was there and it was lovely. And on that bombshell, uh, this has been. <laughs> this has been a. Uh, Another great episode of the Linux Let's Podcast. Uh, I've been Mike. I've been Connor. And I've been Shane. And we will we will let you hear us next week. Is that a thing? Oh no, sorry. We will let you hear us in two days, two weeks. Is that a thing? Goodbye. Bye bye.